Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, Heavenly Father, for the truth of your word. And would you let Jesus' words ring in our hearts today that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And so, Lord, open up our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So there was a rich man, and he had lots of money, and he had three sons, and he wasn't really sure about what was going to happen in the life to come. And so he told his sons, I want to make sure I'm prepared for whatever comes next. So what I want you to do is each of you, uh, I want you to take part of your inheritance. So, and actually it was a good percentage of the inheritance. I want you to take $100,000 each and put that in my casket. So in case I need it, I'll have it in the next life. And so the firstborn son, um, because typically a lot of them are rule followers, did exactly what his dad said. He got $100,000 in cash and took it up to the casket and placed it in the casket. The second born thought, well, this is sort of foolish. I mean, after all, I'm not sure um, you're going to take, and who says that you're going to take American currency anyway, but because he sort of felt obligated and dad said, I guess I'll still do it anyway, he took $100,000 and he placed it in the casket. And so the third child um, went and he said, well, my first two brothers have done it. So he walks up to the casket and he walks away and his brothers notice that he's still got a lot of money in his hands. In fact, he's got a, really a lot of money in in his hands. And, and they asked him, he said, well, hey, did you place uh, your $100,000 in the casket? He said, oh, yeah, I did. I wrote a check for $300,000. <laughs> There's a lot of misunderstandings uh, about what it really means to be rich. And frankly, what is it going to do um, on the other side of eternity when we leave this place. And, and I realize that if there's nothing that we um, can realize, it's this, that our lives are very short. And the older I get, the more I realize that there's not a lot of time left in my life. We don't know how many days that we have. And so that shouldn't be the question we focus our life around. It should be, what am I doing with my life, with this amount of time that I have? And that's our series, Be Rich. It's not how much you have, it's what you do with what you have. And we've been camping out in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, my Bible now just opens right to it since we've been preaching from the same text of Scripture for the last three weeks. And hopefully your Bible maybe is getting um, dented in that little section of Scripture and it's sinking into your heart a little bit. And we're starting now in verse 17 of chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present world. Again, this present world, because there is a world yet to come. And so don't get all wrapped up in this present world. But what can you do while you're here? Well, command those who are rich. Well, who are rich? And if you're here with us for the first week, we answered that question. Who's rich? I'm rich. That's the answer to that question. I am rich. And this morning, as you woke up on a nice, cool, crisp morning, if you woke up oh, with a roof over your head, you are rich. It looks uh, right now, I still, at this point in my life, still have 20-20 vision. It looks like everybody has clothes on. That's good. That would be weird if you didn't um, to come to church without any clothes. But if you have clothes on today, that means you are rich. In fact, some of you uh, put on the winter coats this morning because it was a little cold and hats and gloves. You're rich um, if you have that. A lot of you, in just a few moments, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. There's that little phrase in there. Uh, Give us this day our daily bread. Now, a lot of us will pray that um, without really even thinking about it because, frankly, we're not worried about daily bread because we're going to go home. We've already got bread taken care of for today. In fact, probably for a week, maybe even a month in our refrigerators, freezers, and cupboards, uh, we don't have to worry about that. And if we don't have to worry about it, guess what? We are Rich. So what should we command those who are rich in this present world to do? Well, here's what we should do. First Timothy 6 says, do not be arrogant. Wouldn't that be nice if we could get rid of arrogance? That would be great. Don't be arrogant, nor put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Now, this was true back when Paul wrote this a couple thousand years ago. And it's even more true, I think, today that wealth is so uncertain. 
You ever look at a little stock market, little graph, you know, it goes up and down just like the last few years. You remember 2000, oh, I remember the bubble. Yeah, when that thing just crashed and went, went down, I remember that. But then it sort of steadily grew and we had a few dips along the way. You remember um, the Brexit? Oh, the world's coming to an end. Ah, and that was like two days worth of the stock market. And then it bounced right back up. But it goes up and down. And that's just the nature of the stock market. But some of you are like, well, yeah, but hasn't it just gone up over time? Yeah, you can take any 10-year period and there's an upward trajectory in the stock market. Um, God has abundantly blessed this nation that we have. But um, you can take any piece of that. Like, for instance, when I lived in Houston, there was a little company, some of you might remember, called Enron. (laughs) I had members of my church that worked for Enron. And I can remember, man, I'm going to be able to retire early. Man, our stock is going through the roof. This thing is incredible. And you know what happened to it, right? Boom, zero is what that was worth. What does that sound like? Well, this wealth is so uncertain. So don't put your hope in wealth of this world, which is so uncertain. What's the anecdote to not putting your certainty into wealth in this world? Well, that was our second week that we talked about. The idea is contentment. That's the anecdote. And so we say, I am content with what God has given to me. That if I have a lot, great, I'm content with that. If I have nothing, I'm content with that. God, I am happy with whatever you provide for me. Be content. So here's what Timothy, or Paul writes to Timothy. But put your hope in God. Don't put it in wealth. Put it in God who richly provides us everything for our consumption. Or for our offering. Now, what does he say? What, God richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. Isn't that a wonderful word? Enjoyment. That God intends for us to enjoy things of life. That is not a sin to enjoy nice things. It's not a sin to enjoy a nice meal out. It's not a sin to enjoy a home. It's not a sin to have nice clothes. Uh, It's when those things begin to have us that that begins to be a problem. God says, I provided all this for your enjoyment. I I can remember... um, had a couple times where this truth just sort of rang through in, in my life so often. I had a, in 1995, bought my very first house in Clear Lake, Texas, outside of Houston. And the lady um, and uh, family, rather, I bought the home from, um, didn't know who they were. They were a name on a piece of paper, as is typically the case. And, and so it came to um, the time we're doing some inspections on the home and sort of the final step process. And uh, she was home one day, and she apologized. She goes, oh, I'm sorry. I've been working hard trying to get everything cleaned up and get out of here, and I'm, I'm leaving right now. And I said, no, it's actually great to meet you because you've just been a name on a sheet of paper. I'm, I'm John. And, and she goes, yeah, it's great, great to meet you. And I said, I want to thank you because every time I've been here, the home is immaculate. And I tell you, that's, that's wonderful. I really appreciate that, and it, it meant a lot to me. And frankly, it was made this home really attractive. She goes, oh, that's so great to hear because I was so worried about that because I'm losing my eyesight, and I'll, I'll be blind soon. And I can't see real well, so I can't make sure everything is, is right. But I, I really worked hard to try to make sure that was going to happen. I'm like, man, I'm so sorry. What, what happened? She goes, well, it's, it's been a progression. I, I'm just losing. There's nothing they can do. I'm going to be losing my eyesight. But she goes, I, I'm frankly okay with this. And I'm perfectly content because I've only had a couple of prayers in the last several years. And, and one prayer is, God, would you just allow me to have eyesight long enough where I can see my youngest son graduate from high school and he's graduating this year and it looks like I'll have my sight to see him graduate and I'm just praising God for that he has been amazing to me and I just thank him for that and she goes my other prayer uh, was that somebody would buy this house that we uh, have made a home for so many years raising our kids here we wanted to go to somebody special when I found out you're a pastor I was like thank you Jesus for that Man, she understands the idea of being content. I'm like, you're losing your eyesight and you are filled with joy. That is just inexpressible. And I said, that is inspiring to me. And so prayed for her and went away. And I'll never forget her as long as I live. You know, as a pastor, I have an opportunity to build relationships and friendships with with people all over. And a lot of times when they're going through just some of the worst seasons of their life, and I'd met this guy and built a relationship with him, was going through just terminal, terminal cancer, and it was horrendous, and went through the chemo and the radiation and several surgeries. And I remember visiting him at one point, and he had finished a regiment of chemo and and radiation, and, and he just got a little bit of his taste buds back. 
And I remember talking to him, he's like, man, this is absolutely amazing. Like for the first time in years, I've been able to taste something that doesn't just taste bland anymore. And isn't it amazing that God gives us taste buds? He was telling to me that they, like everything doesn't just taste like this. I mean, why did God give us taste buds to begin with? And I can't believe it's taken me all this time to realize how good our God is, that he has given us taste buds for our enjoyment of that. And I thought, man, you are battling cancer and you don't have many more days on this earth and you are finding joy in that. How does that happen? Well, the reason that happens is they understand this truth that we have an outrageously generous God. We have an outrageously generous God who pours out so many blessings upon us. Why do we have color? Well, God loves color, evidently. He didn't want us to live in a black and white world. Can you imagine what that would look like if that's all we could ever see? There's so many things about this that we have an outrageously generous God. So what should we do with that? Paul writes, command those who are rich. Now command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and be willing to Share, And that's really our theme for this Be Rich series is be rich and be willing and generous to share. And here's a little side note that I think is important to make because I think a lot of people have this misconception about following Jesus, that God does not call everyone uh, to live a life of poverty and joylessness. (laughs) God doesn't call us to live a life of poverty and joylessness. And, and I think a lot of Christians um, think that that is really our goal, to be as miserable as we possibly can be and suffer for Jesus um, this side of heaven, like somehow that makes a difference. I, I hope that you see in me the joy of following Jesus. I absolutely love Jesus. I love following Jesus. My life is better with Jesus. I hope that it is exuded not just here at church, but out in the community. I hope people See that. That is amazing to me that God loves me and I am filled with that inexpressible joy that it will never go away. And I hope that you feel that same kind of joy. But you know why we don't have to live a life of poverty and joylessness? Man, because Jesus did. Every Christmas season that comes around, I'm mindful of the fact that if there was ever a person on this earth that should have come with an entourage, it should have been Jesus. I mean, this could have been like gold-plated chariot coming down from heaven and born in the most palatial palace that the world has ever known. But where does God come? No, he comes in the lowliest form that you could possibly be born among animals in a stable. That's the way the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes. No luggage from heaven. No care packages coming down from heaven. And why did he do that? Why? He gave it all up for us. And he didn't live a life of joy. He could have. He owns everything. If Jesus wanted his life to be about him and everybody serve my needs, it could have been and should have been that way. But no, God said Jesus set before him. The joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and he scorned its shame. And that Jesus said, I'm not going to be involved in this world living for joy in this world. Because I'm going to lay that down. Because frankly, the greater joy is yet to come. When I give up my life and I pay for the debts and the sins and the mistakes of mankind forever and ever. And I see these people in eternity in heaven with me. There is where my joy is. And I'm not going to sacrifice this temporary joy on this earth for what my mission is. Which is to come and to live and to die and then rise again. That you might be set Free. Jesus did it. That's why we don't have to. This is, I think, what the psalmist was getting to when he understood the heart of God. And he wrote this in Psalm 145. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. You satisfy the desires of every living thing. How many li- Every living thing. What do you do again? Satisfied the desires. Well, if this is true, why are so many people living unsatisfied lives? Could it be that maybe we're chasing after things that don't bring satisfaction? 
For any parent who's ever had kids at Christmas time, you know how long the satisfaction of new gifts last at Christmas, right? About a millisecond after the last present is opened. And then it's like, when's Christmas again? When do we start doing this all over again? And why? Because somehow in the little minds, they've bought into what a lot of us have bought into and live in our lives, that if I just could have this, that will bring me satisfaction in life. Instead of looking to the one who provides everything for satisfaction. And so we make the misassumption that everything is for our consumption. And we make a mistake that joy comes from consumption. Joy doesn't come from consumption. What does joy come from? It comes from being used by God to accomplish his purpose. That's where true joy comes from. When you're used by God and God sets these things up that you accomplish his purpose. I put on my Facebook a week ago, Friday, I was out running, and it was sort of a weird morning. Friday was my day off, and so I get up early in the morning, and I just run. And, and so God, I woke up, and God says, you're going to run somewhere different today. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a little weird. God doesn't usually tell me where to run, but I, okay, I'll, I'll, whatever. And I'm going down this, he said, I want you to turn left here. So I'm like, all right, I turn left. And so now I'm on, on uh, Beltline Road going past Cedar Hill State Park, and I'm running on the side of the road. It's like 6 a.m. in the morning, and I, I go up over the hill past the state park, and finally God says, okay, stop, turn around, and go now on the other side of the street. And so I'm like, okay, guess whatever. And I felt really good. I felt like, man, I'm communing with God, having this kind of time with him, and I'm I'm, I'm moving pretty quick, at least for me. I'm not moving like Pastor Tim fast, but like nine-minute mile fast, so it felt pretty good about myself and in stride. And, and I, I see as I'm coming over this hill, this car is there, and it wasn't there before, but it's, it's there now. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to really stop because I, I feel good. I don't want to stop. I want to continue to run, but I'm like, I, I probably should. And so I, I stop, and this lady gets out of her car, and, and I'm like, hey, do you need some help? And she goes, yeah, I, I don't know what to do. I got a flat tire, and, and I'm just going to call roadside assistance. I'm like, and she goes, but I'm really nervous about everything and and uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to take for them I'm like tell you what by the time they get here I can change your tire you want me to change your tire for you I'd be happy to do that so I get down and change the tire she's like I, I'd like to learn how to do this because I don't know how and so explain to me what you're doing so I'm changing the tire and explaining it to her and she goes I, I feel like I need to tell you something it's probably going to be a little strange I'm like I, I've heard a lot of strange things so go ahead I'd love to hear strange things that's great she goes you know I was in the car and she goes I got the flat tire and I was really like maybe I can drive on it but then like the tire just blew out so there was no more drive anymore. And so I finally pulled over and I was really nervous because my boss is gone and I have to open up the, the business and everybody's sort of going to be waiting on me and now I'm going to be late and I'm going to get in trouble for this and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know how to change a tire and who do I call. And, and I was fretting over this and God just sort of spoke to me. He said, no, 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 your, your guardian angel is going to be coming over that hill in just a minute. And she goes, about as soon as that happened, I see you running over the hill. I'm like, I'm a pretty bad guardian angel, like from that standpoint. That's <laughs> got to be disappointing if you're waiting for your angel. And here I show up, sweaty mess and showing up and in your life. And she goes, man, that's, that's really, I said, isn't that just like our God though, that just sends somebody right at the time. And I said, I wasn't planning on running on this road. God just told me to turn. And then he told me to turn around. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, that is just like God, isn't it? But you know, it's even greater than changing a flat tire and being used in that kind of circumstance is getting the opportunity to share Jesus with somebody. And seeing them go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, seeing a heart that didn't know Jesus all of a sudden being awakened to be excited about there's a God who loves me and I believe in Jesus now. There is nothing greater than being a part of that to accomplish his purpose because that is the kingdom mindset that, that God has. And so this is what Paul alludes to with Timothy when he writes in verse 19, in this way. They will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Anybody want to hold on to like a truly life kind of thing? Not just grab and get what you can. Not to be unsatisfied and wonder what's next. But to hold, anybody want to hold that life that's truly life? This is what you do. You understand that you're rich and I'm content and I want to be generous with everything that God has given to me. That's life. That's truly life. This is kingdom building. This is what followers of Jesus do. That is what this whole series has been about. And we've had this little mantra that we started the first week and added to last week and we'll finish up this week. Um, and I want to give this again to you and we'll recite this together. Um, and it started by saying I am rich and um, everything I have is from you. And then last week, and this is completely my fault because I forgot to put in last week's in this week to add to that. So I'm just going to inject in, 
is from you, and then we're going to inject what we did last week, and it started, enable me to be content with what you have given me. Teach me to be generous. I am rich. Everything I have is from you. Enable me to be content with what you have given me. Teach me to be generous. All right, we're going to recite that. I'll try to speak really loud for the second one so you can catch it if you don't remember from last week or from me just saying it twice. Let's just repeat this because I want this to get from our head um, into our heart and into our behaviors if we can live this way. Ready? I am rich. Everything I have is from you. Enable me to be content with what you gave me. Teach me to be generous. All right, one more time. I am rich. Everything I have is from you. Enable me to be content with what you gave me. Teach me to be generous. And that's what we've been doing with this series. And we want to practice this uh, today. And we, um, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we're doing a special offering in the month of November. So you've got today and then next week will be sort of the last opportunity to do a special gift for Be Rich. And 100% of what we raise goes to three organizations that our elders have chosen. We've heard about first two and we'll hear about another here now. But again, to remind you of what we wanted to do is we wanted the community to know that we believe that we have a generous God and we want to be generous right back to you. And so we wanted to write three checks. And, and so we had this goal of we wanted to raise um, uh, $30,000 and give three organizations checks of $10,000 each. And so quickly doing the math of that, if you, um, because you're here today, and if everyone who attends out of the 600 that come on a weekend, if they would give a one-time gift of $49.99, right, just one time, one time $49.99, that enables us to write those three checks of $10,000 each. Now, I know some of you, um, like my daughter, doesn't have. Forty nine ninety nine. I paid my daughter's forty nine ninety nine, um, so she could be a part of the Be Rich campaign. Uh, but some of you can write bigger checks, and if you can, that's wonderful. Um, and we can all be generous together, and we'll celebrate that. So if you'd like to give to Be Rich, you can do that via our website. If you have a check and still pay by check, you can write uh, Be Rich in the memo line, or stick it in an envelope and write Be Rich on it. Um, anyway, you want to give it to us, we'll make sure um, that that gets to those organizations. But next week will be uh, the last opportunity we have to be rich for our community. So I want to give you one last opportunity to hear from an organization. It's called Mana House, and they provide a lot of assistance for a lot of elderly and for a lot of people who are just going through uh, really difficult times. I had prayed for Sissy. She was going to be here. She's the director there. I talked to her on Thursday, and she goes, I apologize for not calling you back. I have been so sick, and I, I just feeling ill, but I knew I needed to call you back. And so I, we talked for a little while, and then I said, well, let me pray for you. I'd like for you to get better. That would be wonderful. So let me pray for you, and then got a call early this morning. She says, I can't even get out of bed this morning. I'm really, really ill. And I thought, well, that doesn't say a lot for my prayers. I am no Bill Dash, that is for sure. Um, but evidently my prayers uh, didn't work. And so I'll keep praying for you. And if you would pray for Sissy, but she said, here's a video. And I wanted you to know a little bit about what we do. I'm the inventory manager here at uh, Manor House in Midlothian. And we actually uh, service over 105 seniors that come in each month to where we can let them choose what they'd like to choose. We, we try to make it a, a choice to where they're able to pick what they want to eat because I don't actually know what they want to eat. We got volunteers and, and uh, workers out here that are helping right now to sort through stuff and get help keep, try to keep it clean. But we'd really appreciate it if you'd like to volunteer. It would help us out tremendously. Men House is a, a community outreach. We, um, we exist so that people uh, within our community, and we deal uh, with parts of Venus, parts of Cedar Hill, parts of Oxahatchee, all of Sardis um, and Ovilla, and all the 76065 zip code. But we exist so that we can help them through their immediate crisis, um, which, which may be um, an electric bill. Uh, it could be rent. It could be medicine. It could be um, a patient needs a hospital bed. Uh, you know, whatever whatever their immediate crisis is. We're very blessed here at Manor House. It's just the people here in the, in the city of Midlothian care about who they want to help and who they want to feed. And it's awesome that they do this. They come together as a community and we, we're neighbors. We're neighbors. I try to tell each everybody, you know, instead of a client, I tell them it's a neighbor coming in because they are our neighbors. And, uh, 
It's, it's pretty awesome.